So, um, hi everyone, welcome to our panel. So my name is Sarika Garg. I am the Chief Strategy Officer at TradeShift. And uh, today we are gonna talk about diversity, inclusion, and how that impacts the future of work. Um, so I have a wonderful panel here. I almost actually wanna go and talk about, start talking about actually myself and why this panel is so important for me. Uh, I personally have been a minority all my life. Uh, I grew up in Africa, where I was a minority. I went to school in the US, and, and now I work in Silicon Valley, Valley uh, in the tech world. Um, and one thing that I found out is you almost have to look for places of work or people who actually can see what you bring to the table, rather than what you look like on the surface. Um, and so I actually want to start by, you guys are all champions of diversity in, in many different ways. So I want to thank you for being champions because it's with people like you that we can actually bring about a change. And uh, to start with, uh, I would love for you guys to introduce yourself uh, and tell us a little bit about your personal story about how you became a champion around diversity and workplace uh, yourselves. And Caroline, if you can maybe start, it would be wonderful. Yeah, um, I think it's good afternoon now. It's absolutely fantastic to be here. And this whole panel is about curiosity from the edge. Um, I gotta say, I think I have the gift of the misfit. Um, I, my story to hear is, uh, is very personal. Uh, I was born with ocular albinism. I am registered legally blind, which means I can't get to see any of you. And I'm well known to say you all look like George Clooney, even the women. <laughs> um, and I, I, my sight is if you put glasses on and put Vaseline in front of them, that's my vision. But the reason that I look like I am so visual is that my parents, when they found out about my sight when I, in 1971, they decided to bring me up as a sighted child. Um, they really believed that labels are for jam jars and did not want me to find by a medical condition. So I went through the first 17 years of my life having no idea that my sight was any different to anybody else's. And I discovered about the fact I was legally blind at the age of 17 when I went to get my motorbike license, because I've always wanted to be a motorbike chick. Um, it was at that point that I was like, I do not want to have a disability because I thought I would be left out. And I hid it for 11 years. Uh, and eventually when I was with Accenture uh, as a management consultant, I came out of the closet um, and owned the whole of myself. Um, that very conscious act of discrimination to not own my disability is something I've been working at since then. And for the last 18, 19 years, I am now, if you look at labels, a social entrepreneur, social innovator, a change maker, a troublemaker, uh, a dangerous dreamer. And my big obsession is to put disability equally on the global business leadership agenda. And I'm the founder of Hashtag Valuable, which has a massive announcement to make here in Davos. It's a very important moment for us. Wonderful. Can I ask you, uh, Caroline, what made you hide? Um, I don't think what made me hide is any different to anybody. Everybody hides something. I think every single one of us wants to belong. Yeah. And belonging is not easy. Self-acceptance is, is a continuous journey. And when you are on the edges, because disability is still on the edges of business, and it is one of the biggest of the most marginalized issues, it's, you didn't, I didn't see myself in business. I didn't see myself in society around labels that I knew. So I was so worried that if I owned it, that I would be left out. And so I wanted to belong, not to fit in. And so um, it has been that constant interplay. But now in belonging, sorry, owning it, I gotta say, I've had the most extraordinary 20 years of my life, so I'm better, I have better being visually impaired than I am fully sighted, so it was Thank my you. mistake. So that's, that's a very interesting story, and oftentimes at the, when you're at the edges, it's very difficult to understand whether you will be accepted or not, right? Yeah. Um, Olivier, how, do you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your journey? Sure. My name is Olivier Ollier. I'm a neuroscientist by day and a DJ by night. And I'm the president of Emotive, a company uh, that is the global leader in brain tech, neurotechnologies. Um, my passion for human behaviors and brains started when I was a kid for some medical reasons. I couldn't play with the others. 
And so I was the kid standing and observing and looking at the others and living vicariously through the games of all the guys and girls in my class. And this is why I developed this fascination for human behavior. And this is why you might find me one day on a um, subway, just lost in observing people even here at Davos. And as I grew up and started to study, I discovered there were sciences to better understand how people function, but also those sciences, psychology, cognitive science, neuroscience, um, they taught me some kind of differences that I couldn't see, the invisible. Neuroscience and neurotechnologies are giving us access to the invisible, what is inside us. But very, I mean, one of the saddest things is that almost 80% of the brain data we have at the moment in academia and in the medical world has been collected on Caucasian males living in Western Europe and North America. And I think we can all agree to say that this is not diverse and absolutely not representative. So with uh, Emotive, the company that I work with at the moment, we have a mission to provide access to brain health to the underserved, but more importantly, to create the most diverse and complete database of brain data in the world to better understand all of our differences and to better serve people in various contexts, but the main one in the workplace. Right, and uh, you know, when, when we talked on the phone and you mentioned this, it, it struck me that as we get into machine learning and AI, if we don't take care of what data we are feeding into our machine learning, we're gonna get the same out. So it's so important to think of this so much more broadly as you are. So uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing that you guys are doing. Um, Thorkel, you have a wonderful story and, and a very touching story. Can you maybe share with us and introduce yourself as well? Yes, thank you. I'm, um, I'm Thorkel Sonne. I'm founder of Specialistane. Um, and, and we are trying to change the labor market globally to be more inclusive of autistic people and bring the dynamic of, of autistic people and people with similar challenges into the workforce. Uh, for the benefit of, of the employer and society and individuals and families. But it all started um, when our youngest son was three years old. At home, we saw him as the same as his older brothers because he was in his comfort zone. He was everything you could want from a child, caring, trustworthy, fun, everything you would want. But in the kindergarten, they said, he's different. So thanks for the theme same at the edge of different. They saw a child outside his comfort zone. So he was different. And how do we deal with people who are different in a very structured society where there's so many children per, per employee in the kindergarten? And if people need extra care, you have to label them somehow. Yeah. So he was followed by a psychiatrist and he was diagnosed as autistic, a lifelong disability that uh, cannot be cured. We, we have to get used to that as parents. So suddenly our, our kind of ideal family situation, good job, uh, good family, uh, three kids, suddenly we have a disabled child among us. So um, the kind of perfect picture of a family were replaced with something else. That, that was a scary moment, but our son was the same wonderful child the day before and the day after the diagnosis. It was only in the mindset of the parents that we had tumbled. So we realized that we, we just have to get to know his paradigm, his world, and support that. So we learned that uh, autistic kids, um, they, they are easy to bully at school. They will like there's a high risk for being a dropout and being rejected by the labor market because they don't have the social skills to excite a recruiter and to, to fit into the social standards of a traditional workplace. So we decided to, to change that, um, not change our son, not, change, not focus on 
training autistic people to behave like non-autistic people so they can fit into a workplace and say, we need the, the skills and personalities of people who are different, like autistic people. And then I set a goal to generate one million jobs after having been approached by families in more than 100 countries, because this is not a Danish thing, it's a global situation. And the, the welfare systems are different, but in all communities, there are families, there are employers, there's some kind of education system. And in some countries, we have a very strong welfare uh, system to support that. But, but how do we scale using modern technology? Uh, how do we uh, activate all the parents? All the, we could create the biggest grassroots movement that the world has seen. If, if we do this right. So, and you know, I mean, coming from the technology world, actually, uh, you know, children and people with autism actually bring a lot to the table and are yeah. very, very valuable. And uh, it's just that we haven't created the structures to allow them to enter and be part of it in a way that they're not outsiders. So it's a very great cause. Or the mindset about yeah. the opportunity. And yes. I think that's just really exactly. important. Sorry, just to build on it, it's the mindset. You know, autism is, is part of 20% of our global population of people with disabilities. And that is a market worth 8 trillion. Yeah. And how are you going to know that market if it's not in your business, right? Mm. So it's a combination. There's a right. huge opportunity for business. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, Trolls, you come in with a very different viewpoint because you work for the government and you actually have a chance to make change at a very big level. Please tell us about your journey and what your cause is. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Torsten Paulsen, and I have been minister almost eight years now, but uh, right now I'm minister for labor in Denmark. And uh, my mission is, in fact, to create better conditions uh, for having more people to be a part of the workforce. Uh, and we have set a goal uh, some, some months ago that in 2025, 20, 15% with uh, disabilities should be uh, in the workforce. So uh, we have set that, go that goal and we, we think that businesses have a lot to offer and also to include in, in, in fact even more people in, in the workforce. And uh, why we uh, set that goal was in fact also to create a public discussion about how to, to reach the goal. Mm -hmm. So we can return each year and look upon the figures and saying, are we on track? Um, so these are, these are all different, very different stories, but there's a common thread here, and the common thread of, of how can we bring what we perceive as different and make it part of a whole and wonderful thing. And, you know, oftentimes what we see is we focus on what's not working, and, and I, I feel that a lot in my life. Like, I wish change was faster. I wish things, things were different. But the reality is uh, things are changing. I mean, we're having this panel that's wonderful, and... Uh, and oftentimes, if you actually look at what works, is when you can build on top of it to, uh, to make something even better. And so I wanted to actually look for examples of where you've seen something really working. Uh, so we can actually share that with, with our audience over here. Anybody, any choices? Anybody wants to go? <laughs> well, um, from my side, uh, I've seen so many. We, we have been working with more than 100 big companies to, um, to help them recruit and manage autistic people. And what we hear, the feedback we get is, they get the job done in a precise manner. Typically, autistic people have a good memory, attention to detail. Um, some can see patterns. They are very dedicated to the work. They are honest. They are, they are, they are trustworthy. Um, and that... That is, that's personalities and skills that all companies should really embrace. Um, but what we see is a place where autistic people thrive has become a better place to work for all. Because you, you have to show this respect and interest for people who are a bit different. You have to provide accommodation to make sure that everyone are comfortable in the workplace. Yeah. You have to set your expectations clearly. Uh, say what you mean, mean what you say, and if there are questions, they should always know where to get and get some guidance. If those four values, if you live those, they'll make you a basically better manager. Yeah. And, and this is what we also hear, that the manager says, 
we have become better managers, and that also has a positive effect on the co-workers. So what you're saying is, uh, is that what you see is if you can actually go and talk to those managers and to those companies, and you bring in this value of what they bring, then, then you see the change. Um, uh, so, Carolyn, yeah, I think I'm you... I'm bursting, of course. Yes, I know, <laughs> I, know, I, know, I, know you, I know you're actually working with companies as well. And uh, tell yeah, us, so tell one, us one thing I really doing, want to yeah. pick up on is yeah. actually this great point that Torco made. People forget that the remote control was designed for visually impaired and blind people, and we all love the remote control. Um, SMS texting was for deaf people. So I love this idea of universal design and thinking. But for me, there's a real success is, okay? Yeah. Is leadership in business. We believe that inclusive business creates inclusive society. Um, so, but at the very top of that, our allies for change are leaders. What happened when Sheryl Sandberg lent in? She was influential as a leader. She had a brand behind her and she uses platforms. So when we see that happening, when we see leaders and the reason we're here with, uh, you know, taking a main stage panel on disability business inclusion is because Paul Pullman stood up. So leaders lead leaders. But then the allies for change, where we can see really good results, is when that next generation, yeah. who believe in inclusion, are challenging the brands, brands they work with, to be inclusive. So, so leaders are role models. Leaders and models. we all look for role models to, to model ourselves. And we so do. we've got to start with the leaders and we've got to start at the and top. Just is, being human and having yeah. this conversation yeah. because when we don't speak about things, nothing, get hap nothing changes. Yes. So just respect to F and respect to this panel because if we talk about taboo, then taboo stops being taboo. Right, right. absolutely. And stops being on the edge. Yes, that's absolutely right. Olivia, what are you doing? Because you've created this database. I know you're working with companies. What, are you, what, what success have you seen? Yeah. Absolutely. What is interesting in our case is we've worked with uh, disabled people, but also with every person. That's our way sure. to be inclusive. And a lot of you are likely to work in companies where there are a lot of people that need to start working in front of a computer at 9 a.m. and can't take a break until 12. Regardless, their personality, their skills, their level of attention, of focus, of allocation of bandwidth. Yeah. And what we've been doing is collecting rigorously neuroscientific data on stress, attention distraction, cognitive load in the workplace, and to use this data in order to personalize and tailor the day of work of people. Some people cannot focus for more than 45 minutes. So what? Give, allow them to take a 15-minute walk. They are losing 15 minutes of screen time, but when they come back, their attention level is back up. Right. And in addition to improving their wellness, their performance in the workplace, people realize that the employers are caring because it's designed for them based on who they are. And we all have our strengths and weaknesses, and we are measuring at scale in a very affordable and democratized way, what makes us who we are. We hear everywhere human-centric design, human-centric this, but how come almost no one until very recently was looking at one of the key parts of what is making us human, our brain. We're not just our brains. We're brains, bodies evolving in our environments with history, yet not looking at the human brain Makes no sense. I'm highly biased, by the way. I forgot to tell you. My name's Olivier. I'm a scientist. I'm super biased. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, yes. I approve my message. <laughs> so, so what you're saying is really interesting. What you're saying is we almost look at the world too narrow, right? And, and you know, either we look at the brain or we look at you know, people with, of a certain way of yeah. what they look like. And what if we actually broke all those yeah. ways of thinking? And, and understand and, people better. Start talking about it more. Yeah age, exactly. every difference you can yes. find and that we can measure, that becomes an asset. What about the heart? You didn't mention the heart. Ah, oh, the, the heart. heart. <laughs> the heart. <laughs> Seriously, we're talking Absolutely. about this. So where's the heart? He's a scientist. The heart is up there. <laughs> yeah, I know you've got a heart. <laughs> so, what's, no. Yeah, please go ahead. No, no, just saying that it's, it's really important to be able to consider who we are, especially as we experience the fourth industrial revolution and everyone is freaking out because jobs are going to be lost because of AI and robots and people need to be reskilled. But in order to really help people 
learn new skills and keep their jobs, you need to understand them better. Yeah. There's no one size fits yeah. all to reskill people like execute programs that you're gonna you know, roll out like that. Yeah. And this is definitely what we're helping as well. So, so understanding people starting at the top, I think one of the biggest ways you can make a change is actually legislature, right? And, and uh, can you talk a little bit about what success you've seen? I mean, you're, you're also working in a world where the workforce is changing. Uh, significantly, and, and so you're dealing with a lot of people feeling actually on the edges. Yeah, maybe I can just uh, tell a quite unique story from, from Denmark about uh, how we some years ago created a legislation giving a, a person the possibility to work five or ten hours paid by, by the company, and then uh, the, the state will pay the rest. So that, in fact, gives a lot of people uh, the possibility to be a part of the workforce, even if they are not uh, able to work uh, full time. Yeah. And that we have created, in fact, more than 25,000 jobs uh, during the last couple of years uh, because of, of that. And it has also given a lot of businesses and companies the possibility, in fact, to, to employ uh, some of these people. And they're, they're doing uh, very, very well. And in fact, we have seen that maybe you are able to work five or 10 hours per week, but then after a year, you are able to work 10 or 15 hours per week. So it's in fact a success story. That's wonderful. So we're coming to an end of our panel. I want to actually do a fireside round, a fire uh, round um, and ask you to maybe uh, in one minute describe if, you know, if we fast forward five years from now, uh, what is the one thing that you'll feel that, you know, you, you made a change or success, we're moving in the right direction of success. So, uh, Carolyn, do you want to start and we'll just go down? <laughs> okay, well, in five years' time, I'd love me not to be on a panel like this. Um, I think in this time of transformation, this age of transformation, leadership is about creating a sense of belonging. And that's why I talk about the head and heart and emotion replacing auto, I mean, we're worried about automation, so what do we bring uniquely as humans? Creativity in our heart. But what I really want to see is I want to end diverse-ish corporate behavior. I want to be part of seeing how we can create universally inclusive corporate cultures where we stop pitching the diversity and inclusion agenda against each other, and we stop saying it's one thing one year and another thing another year. I want to see disability equally on the global business leadership agenda, I want to see a la carte inclusion ended and see the human experience properly represented in our companies, the most powerful, probably, entities, I believe, in the world to make change happen. Thank you. That's really powerful. Olivier? Ideally, I would like that the same people that are kindly asking me if I have a specific diet when I'm eating at the restaurant of a company where I'm working, those people would also take into account how different I am from a cognitive and emotional point of view based on very rigorous science. And the same way that we would take care of these differences for something that is very important, food, um, when it comes to workplaces, I would love to see real flexibility in the workplace that is not just a matter of hours, but is a matter of who I am and who you guys are based, again, on what science is bringing us, and technology, to your point, the fact that we can <clears throat> finally scale at low cost and mm. leverage artificial intelligence and data for the better good in the workplace. So my, my husband is lactose-free and gluten-free and, I don't know, all these other things, and it's wonderful that we can go to restaurants and get whatever food Mm -hmm. and choices of it. So, so we, can, we can do it. There is absolutely hope to do this in our business. Someone That's asked it, me if yeah. we could do a stupid free uh, environment at work. So let's see what we can do about that. Yeah. <laughs> no, then we don't have a spare. Like, <laughs> really? We all can be stupid yeah. sometimes. <laughs> Torkel? I hope that uh, in five years, we, we don't talk about disabled people. We talk about people. Yes. And we use, we use the metaphor of the dandelion. The dandelion is loved by children, they blow dandelions, they make wishes. The dandelion is hated by adults because in the lawn, it's a weed. You used to love it, now you hate it. What happened? Well, what happened is that your own norms 
have been replaced by society's norms. But if you take the dandelion from the lawn, put it in the kitchen garden, treat it well, it will give you back so much. You can make a living out of treating a dandelion as an herb instead of a weed. And every seed of every dandelion has the potential to add value as an herb if ending up in a welcoming environment. It's the same with people. My experience is mostly from autistic people. Most of these end up in not so welcoming environments, but let's start focus on creating these universal environments that are good for, for everyone and not just for autistic people. Because if we can create some truly more inclusive environments in the labor market, in the school system, in the local community, we don't have to talk about so much disability. Yeah. And my success looking five years ahead will, will hopefully be that the mindset uh, will be, be changed. And in Denmark, we have a strong tradition uh, where businesses, unions, and even the government are working together uh, like a tripartite uh, agreement. Hopefully, there will be uh, more possibilities, and hopefully, we will also have a, a better legislation so that we will be focused on, on persons and uh, how they can participate in the workforce. Yeah, no, uh, thank you so much. I, I think uh, to end with, uh, I would say, um, you know, diversity you know, programs are often seen as competing against business, you know, yeah. often. And, and I've seen this at a very personal level where the manager will ask, why are you doing this thing, right? Why don't you just focus yeah. on uh, going and meeting the customer or, or you know, the, your true work job, you know? And I think, uh, you know, the company that I work for, uh, what we believe is, uh, we want to create economic opportunity for all. We, and we talk a lot about we want to connect companies, but companies consist of people. Mm. And, and when you want to create economic opportunity for all, you've got to actually bring all the people together in their full yeah. beauty and, and, and diversity and, and facets for us to be able to really increase GDP and success and of us really actually having a better world. So I know it's, it's a little lofty, but it, it really is true. And yes. so I thank you so much for thank joining you. the panel thank and, and for bringing your perspectives. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.